Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Marche, the webinar director at Advice Chaser. Before we introduce our guests and get started, I do need to do a bit of legal housekeeping. Advice Chaser, the host of this webinar, is not a registered investment advisor. We cannot and do not give financial advice. Today's presentation is for educational purposes only and cannot be considered advice for any person's individual situation. Advice Chaser regularly hosts informative webinars, such as this one, featuring a variety of knowledgeable professionals, many of whom are licensed advisors. Any opinions, ideas, jokes, or principles expressed by presenters are their own, and however true, funny, or interesting are not endorsed by Advice Chaser. Please do not act on the information you hear today without consulting a qualified financial professional. We're thrilled to bring you this educational presentation. Attendees are muted, but we encourage you to ask questions using the chat box. The presenter will answer those queries after the webinar today as appropriate. If you ask a question in the chat box, go ahead and leave your phone number as well. If we can't get to your question during the event, we'll make sure someone reaches out to you after today's event. We want this experience to be as educational as possible, so please don't hesitate to ask for clarification or expansion of the material. And I'd like to introduce you to today's moderator. Terrence Dowling is a certified financial planner professional with Country Financial in the Metro Atlanta area. Terrence prides himself on working hard to provide the best possible service to his clients and helping them plan for life's eventualities, especially if you have a family, like weddings, college, and eventually retirement. Terrence enjoys meeting new people and building one-on-one -on -one relationships and helping clients secure their financial security goals. Terrence, why don't you go ahead and say hello and a few words. Hello, everyone. My name is Terrence Dowling. I'm very excited to be a part of this presentation. This is a very important topic uh, in our nation today. As uh, the population begins to get older, uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a golfer and a tennis player. Neither one of those sports I do very well, but I try very hard. Um, and I have a financial services practice here in North Metro Atlanta, and I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Terrence. I'd love to introduce you to our presenter today. Annalie Kruger is the founder and president of CareRight Inc., the concierge of senior care planning. CareRight assists families in navigating the complexities associated with the aging process by managing crisis situations, developing a proactive aging plan, facilitating family meetings, and providing needed support to struggling caregivers. For Annalie, providing proactive senior care planning to families is more than just a career. It's her passion. Annalie has spent her entire 27-year career in the senior care industry and has become a nationally recognized expert in the field of senior care planning. Annalie is author of the upcoming The Invisible Patient, and that outlines the emotional, physical, and financial toll experienced by family caregivers. And Annalie, uh, you're a frequent presenter with us. We're so grateful to have you back again. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn, stop my sharing here, and I'll turn the presentation time over to you. Okay, very good. Hello, everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your day today to learn about Alzheimer's and dementia. And like Terrence said, this is a um, very predominant uh, issue across the world. And so I think today is a great day to start uh, talking about dementia. So let me share my screen and Hope and pray that this works. <laughs> we can see it. We can see it just fine. Except that it's not advancing. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so today what we're going to talk about is what to do when a parent has Alzheimer's disease. And like Marche said, my name is Anna Lee Kruger. I own Care Right Incorporated and co-founder of Plan for Life Now, which is training for uh, financial planners across the country, actually, to become um, elder planning specialists. So I own those two businesses. So I've pretty much devi devoted my entire career to trying to improve the outcomes of families across the country, whether direct to the consumer, direct to families, or through the conduit of their financial planner. So um, a little bit about me. 
unlike Terrence, I do not golf nor play tennis and nor am I good at any kind of athletics. <laughs> so I do not even try. <laughs> I am a reader. So I, I read <laughs> and play with my dog. <laughs> so <laughs> pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty subdued lifestyle there. So anyway, um, I'm a geriatric social worker consultant. I've been nationwide and virtual working with families across the country since 2012. I started my company Care Right in 2011 and um, as you all probably experience as well, the profile of the typical family has definitely changed. 25, 30 years ago, when I first started as a social worker, I could literally go to your house and your parents and your siblings could easily gather around the kitchen table and we could have a family meeting that I would facilitate and find out what's working well, what's not working, what are the goals. But as the world has changed and families move away from each other, um, the only way to be able to facilitate family meetings and help families all across the country is to leverage technology. So I've been virtual since 2012. Crisis planning is the majority of my cases. Um, despite my best efforts at doing literally hundreds of these types of webinars across the country every year, um, I still try to get families to plan ahead and let's let's talk and let's let's be proactive with developing an aging plan and learning about dementia or whatever it is your loved one has. The reality is 92% of families come to me in the midst of a crisis. Um, I facilitate family meetings. I develop aging plans, which will go over what that entails. I'll show you what the grab and go binder looks like and what's inside the grab and go binder so that you can develop your own binder or use the one that, that I have on my website. Um, we also, um, we do the legwork for families across the country because when we're looking at what's the plan of staying at home with your parent no longer works or is safe or viable, my team and I, we do the legwork and the market research on facilities in your area um, that you can afford, that you or your loved one qualify to move into. You have to financially qualify, you have to physically qualify, and you have to cognitively qualify. And there are a variety of different levels of care and most consumers don't understand what the differences are between the levels of care and there's a lot of things that you need to consider when you're making that move into transitioning from living at home into a care community type setting, like the staffing models, their state survey reports and those kind of things. So we do all of that research for the families and then present you with options um, and walk through what that community matrix offerings are. And then we also teach you what to look for and what to ask about when you do the tour so that you can make informed decisions as a family. So we help families navigate aging issues and we relieve caregiver stress. You can imagine that the people who call me or call my company are the burned out sons and daughters and caregivers. They've realized that what they're doing is no longer sustainable. And for those of you who have a loved one with memory impairment, um, this is, it will become a 24 seven uh, position to become a caregiver. So we'll talk here about what is Alzheimer's and we'll talk about caregiver issues and taking care of yourself um, and just kind of what to expect as the disease progresses and what is an aging plan and, and why it's important to have all of your documents in order. So let's begin. What is Alzheimer's? Alzheimer's is the most common cause of dementia, which is a general term for memory loss and other cognitive abilities that are serious enough to interfere with your daily life. So Alzheimer's is an actual diagnosis. Dementia is just a general term for memory loss that affects your day-to-day -day functioning. It is irreversible, progressive disease that slowly destroys memory and thinking skills and eventually the ability to carry out the simplest of tasks. You have to think of this as a brain disease and this is your brain and it just continually is shrinking. And so that's why you're going to see changes in their mood, their behavior, their ability to think and process information and their safety, ability to make safe decisions and do simple tasks. 
Alzheimer's disease accounts for 60 to 80% of dementia cases, and there is no cure. The facts and statistics about Alzheimer's, it's the sixth leading cause of death in the US, killing more than breast cancer and prostate cancer combined. A person with Alzheimer's lives four to eight years after diagnosis, but can live as long as 20 years. So it's a, that's why we call it in healthcare, we call it the long goodbye. Because every day, every week, every month, every year, you see just ongoing continual declines and losses in your loved one's abilities. More than 6 million Americans are living with Alzheimer's. Almost two thirds of Americans with Alzheimer's are women. One of, more, one of the more than 6 million people aged 65 and older with Alzheimer's in the United States, 3.8 million are women. A woman's estimated lifetime risk of developing at age 65 is one in five. We are seeing a lot more early onset cases of Alzheimer's and dementia. So um, these are important things to be keeping in mind so that as you are aging or have aging loved ones that you really think about this type of information. Alzheimer's and dementia deaths have increased by 16% during the pandemic. That should not be any type of surprise. The issues with care and um, the care of, of these folks that have been in facilities and just the lack of being able to help them and supervise them um, properly has, has caused a lot of death. Over 11 million people provide unpaid care for people with Alzheimer's and dementia. So there again, it's always, it is always the burned out son and daughter or spouse of the, of the person receiving the care um, who calls me for services. Stages of Alzheimer's and symptoms. Move us over. All right, early stage Alzheimer's, we call that mild. Symptoms may not be apparent at this stage, but family, close friends, and doctors would be able to identify kind of the triggers of, hey, something's not quite right. So little red flags might include just coming up with a right, coming up with a wrong word or name, uh, remembering names when introduced to new people, which is a problem because I even have that problem now. <laughs> Having difficulty performing tasks in social or work settings, forgetting material that was just read, losing or misplacing a valuable object. We always hear about if you lose your keys, um, lose your checkbook, lose your purse, experiencing increased trouble with planning or organizing. So a good example of that is just doctor's appointments or appointments in general, not being able to coordinate, okay, traffic or appointments and, and then remembering that you have the appointment. So literally knowing that you have an appointment, putting it on the calendar and then actually following through with that, with that appointment is one of the most um, common things that I see with, with families with the adult kids just totally surprised that their aging parents haven't been to doctor's appointments for months or sometimes even years, depending on how informed the adult children are about dementia and what to look for. So this hopefully that one one tip right there of really looking at your, you know, your parents or your loved ones um, medical appointments is important and checking their um, bank accounts because these folks get scammed every single day. Hundreds of millions of dollars are scammed out of these folks. Stages of Alzheimer's and symptoms. The middle stage is what we call the moderate stage. So again, your brain is shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. Typically the longest stage and it can last for years. Symptoms might include being forgetful of events or personal history, getting kind of their timeline of events, um, their life events kind of jumbled up a little bit. Feeling moody or withdrawn, especially in socially, mentally challenging situations. As the disease progresses, these, um, these folks with dementia really are not going to be able to handle like a stimulating, um, environmentally stimulating situations like going out to eat, weddings, um, funerals, those kind of things, get togethers, traveling, vacations get to be pretty overwhelming and they're not able to cope very well. So you'll see um, changes in their mood, their behavior, and their personality as their disease progresses. They're unable to recall information about themselves, like their address or telephone number, 
and the high school or college that they attended. So you'll notice that there's like significant gaps in their memory. And that's where that timeline that we talked about in the first bullet point gets um, sketchy and not always reliable with information. They experience confusion about where they are or what day it is. They require help choosing proper clothing for the stage or for the season or for the occasion. Um, they have trouble controlling their bladder and bowels. So you might see more incontinence. Or actually, you will see more incontinence or you'll see um, where they go to the bathroom in just different places in, instead of the toilet because they can't find the bathroom. Um, they even get lost in their own house, even if they've been in this house um, for a long time. It's just their memory is, 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 is declining. They experience changes in sleep patterns. They might sleep during the day and be restless at night. They really do need to have structure and routine to their day. And so that's one thing that oftentimes with uh, folks that are still at home that have dementia, they don't have structure, they don't have routine. They may get their days and nights mixed up. So they're up all night and they're sleeping during the day and they're wandering, which is the next bullet point. Um, they have an increased tendency to wander and become lost. If you are in one of the states that has the silver alert, you're very aware of that. So I'm in Florida, we have silver alerts almost every day because these folks are still out there driving or they're walking and they're becoming lost and people are reporting them as missing. So um, if your loved one has ever been lost with driving or out walking or they left their house without proper clothing on, those should be blatant, obvious red flags that your loved one needs more support and may not be able to stay at home without 24 hour care and supervision. Demonstrating personality and behavioral changes, including suspiciousness and delusions or compulsive repetitive behavior like hand wringing or tissue shredding or folding or just kind of rummaging, we call it rummaging, going through drawers or you know folding napkins or just kind of a lot of um, restlessness. You're gonna see that in the middle stages. In the late stages or what we call the severe stages, um, Symptoms are very severe. Individuals lose the ability to respond to their environment, be able to carry on conversations, and eventually they're not able to control their movement. So symptoms may include require around the clock assistance with daily personal care, because at this point in the, in the late stages of Alzheimer's, they are 24 hour care um, is required. There's a lot of family caregivers that are trying to provide this level of care and they're getting burned out by the second because the, at this stage, um, there's, they really need 24 hour care and, and much of it needs to be from a professional so that you don't get burned out. Um, they lose awareness of their recent experiences as well as their surroundings. They really don't know where they are. That's where they get lost. Their experience changes and physical, they experience changes in physical abilities, including walking, sitting, and eventually swallowing. So you'll see, and it's, it falls under physical abilities, but the disease, because the brain is your control center for your body. So, and with the brain shrinking, literally shrinking as this disease progresses, you're going to see more falls because of their visual distortions. Um, so they're, they're um, you know, there's a lot of falls. They might misguide the, the doorway. So you might see a lot of bruises on their arms because they run into the door frames. Um, you'll see that they might sit on the chair arm instead of putting their bottom on the actual seat of the chair. So their chairs tip and they fall. So these are like very specific day-to-day -day things that you might see um, or that you will see if your loved one has late stage Alzheimer's. Um, Swallowing problems, um, eventually their diets will need to be most likely changed to more like a mechanical soft or pureed so that they don't choke. Um, they have difficulty communicating, they lose the words that they're looking for. So they might point or they might grunt or they may not communicate at all anymore because they've lost that ability to find, find words. Um, they also become vulnerable to infections, especially pneumonia. And I'm also going to add urinary tract infections. Um, and they're also prone to, at this stage, um, pressure sores because they're not uh, moving around as much as they um, had been as um, earlier on in the disease when they were more mobile. 
So handling the new paradigm, once there's a diagnosis, you are not just a person that has a job or a family, you are now a caregiver. You are a family caregiver. Your loved one may live for many years. We've talked about how it could be up to 20 years once they are diagnosed. And unfortunately, because, because these early onset or these changes early on can be pretty subtle, oftentimes your loved one has dementia um, for many years before it becomes quite apparent. So they've actually had this disease for much longer than what you might realize. Um, Obviously, as the disease progresses, the caregiving demands increase, so it begins to snowball. You know, it might start out where you just need to do some reminders and cues, and mom, let's wear this today, or help her with her bathing, or helping with groceries because she can't drive anymore, but eventually this will snowball into a very full-time job where they cannot be alone by themselves. You have to do all of the care coordination and interacting with the doctors and scheduling appointments, managing medication, managing toileting, and managing their showers and managing their care. So you can see that this becomes a snowball effect of caregiving, which is why the caregiver burns out. And we know that we have uh, caregivers who are quite sick, still trying to manage the, the care of their loved one. Um, it will affect your family because you can only be pulled in so many directions. You know, a lot of caregivers are the sons or the daughters. They're still working or they're in this, what we call the sandwich generation and you have children at home or in college and you're also taking care of aging loved ones. We also know that if you're the spouse of a loved one with memory impairment and you're in your 70s or 80s or 90s and your health might not be very good itself, so that's why we see the death of the caregiver, 65% um, higher mortality rate for death if you are the uh, spouse of a caregiver trying to provide care because you will neglect your own needs or your parents, um, the parent caregiver will neglect their own, own needs and um, jeopardize their own health and well-being to become a caregiver. Caregiving will affect your finances. Obviously, dementia care is a specialized care, and that specialized care, just like with any other specialized care, is more expensive, but it's also because the disease is so long. Think about 20 years of care provision, you know, and Medicare does not pay for this stuff. So if you need home care that comes out of your pocket, unless you have long-term care insurance or your loved one had long-term care insurance or um, more currently, we're seeing life, um, life insurance hybrids where there's a long-term care component built into the life insurance. So caregiving will affect your finances. We know a, lo a lot of adult sons and daughters are also helping to finance their parents' care. Um, so it will affect your finances. You will need help. Taking care of an Alzheimer's patient can be demanding, especially if you are raising a family and working. And family meetings and planning is important. And we will talk about what that looks like. So when we talk about family meetings, how are we doing? Good. So when we talk about family meetings, the conversations that you'll want to have with your family, and I understand, believe me, I'm a social worker and a mediator. So I know that most families um, don't have family meetings. That's one of the reasons why I started my own company, why I started Care Right in 2011. Um, because when I was a social worker in long-term care facilities and memory care units, um, every day I had families coming in to take a tour because there was a crisis. Mom fell. She broke her hip. She's a caregiver to dad with dementia. And the hospital tells the kids, here's a list of facilities. Go find one by noon tomorrow because we're discharging your mother. And the kids had no idea what questions to ask at the facility. They had no idea what to look for when they were doing the tour. And most kids, when I would ask them, you know, do you have living, does your loved one have a living will, power of attorney? They were always like, I don't know. We never talked about stuff like that. Well, now you're in a crisis and now it's pretty uncomfortable, overwhelming and exhausting. So that's one of the reasons I started my company. Families are not having family meetings. So here is, if you want to be brave and, and try to facilitate your own family meeting, here's kind of some agenda items that you might want to ask. 
What are your goals as you age? I can tell you what most parents' goals are. They tell me that they do not want to be a burden on their kids, but they also want to stay at home as long as possible. Those are the two most common goals that every single senior in nearly three decades has told me. So you might be able to see the problem here. <laughs> they want to stay at home, but they don't want to be a burden on their kids. But guess who gets most of the brunt of the caregiving? It's the adult kids. They're flying back and forth across the country. They're taking time off work. They're burning through their PTO and their FMLA to become family caregivers. Um, and they're not, they're not taking vacations. Their vacation days are used to come to the rescue every time there's a crisis with their parents. So it's nice that mom and dad want to stay at home as long as possible, but we need to make sure that there's enough supports in place to make sure that that's happening without becoming a burden on the kids. Who are you expecting to take care of you? This is a good question <laughs> because this then forms into a whole set of other sub questions that I go through with my clients because sometimes parents will say, well, we don't want, we don't want to be a burden on our kids and we don't expect our kids to take care of you. But like I just said, who ends up taking care of you, your adult children. So we want to make sure that we safeguard the family relationships and we also want to make sure that we safeguard the health and well-being of mom and dad. If you're not a natural caregiver, say you're the say that you're the adult daughter and you're just not a natural caregiver and you have no interest in that or you don't have the relationship with your parents or just the financial ability to do that, we have to come up with plans for families so that you all have the best outcomes possible. So who are you expecting to take care of you? Family, combination of professionals and family, you know, these are good questions to talk about with your family. How did you financially plan to pay for care? This is a touchy, touchy subject. A lot of families don't like talking about finances for a lot of different reasons, but questions you need to ask, do you have long-term care insurance? Or when you do need care, how did you plan to pay for that? Um, do you have savings? savings or veteran benefits or long-term care insurance or how are you going to pay for this care because like I said Medicare does not pay for care like what most consumers think that it will. Where will you live if you can't stay at home? This question is important because especially if you're one of those families like most of ours that you're flying back and forth and there's really no um, no feet on the streets so to speak um, where your loved one lives, you really need to figure out, okay, does it make sense to have mom or dad stay where they are? And who in the adult, who with the adult children has the time capacity, the energy and the finances and the supportive family at home that's saying, okay, that's fine if you fly every month to go check on mom and dad. Or does it make sense to have a conversation about, okay, mom, you live in Texas, dad, you live in, you know, Florida but us four kids live um, in these other states and we can't just keep flying down to, to check on you every time there's a problem. So especially if your loved one has dementia, they absolutely need to have someone there. So will you relocate to be closer to family versus living alone several states away? Who in the family will be able to drop what they're doing to come to the rescue with crisis situations, hospitalizations, falls, strokes, or dementia progression? So this is a good start for questions, um, but don't worry, the list goes on. Because <laughs> we also have the whole, you know, the whole situation of blended families, which can add a whole nother layer of uh, complexity, <clears throat> complexity to these family meetings because a lot of a lot of blended families may not, especially if it's a recent blended family where mom and dad are in their 70s or 80s and the adult children don't really know each other at all. So if you have blended families, here are some things to think about. Have you met all of the adult kids? Do you all know each other and at least have a basic relationship with each other? What is your relationship? Do you call? Do you text? Do you stay in some sort of communication? And I encourage you to do so because your parents will age and they will need care and they will need support. And you have to work as a family. You have to work as a family to figure out solutions. If you can't do it yourself, then you hire people like me to, to help you with making wise decisions. 
So what are your relationships with each other? What happens if your loved one ends up needing to take care of their spouse? Have you ever held a whole family meeting or a Zoom meeting? If your loved one starts to fail, will you separate them and move your loved one closer to you? Who is already helping with which needs, like care oversight, care advocacy, mail management and bill pay, et cetera? You know, how are their finances set up? Is it mingled? You know, is it commingled? Are they separate? And I can tell you, because I work with families across the country and nothing surprises me anymore because I've been doing this for a long time, but when there's a lot of, blend, when there are blended family dynamics, um, you know, and say it's your mom and someone else's dad and, and their dad has a stroke and your mom becomes the automatic caregiver to their dad. And there's a lot of feelings and resentment that can say, look, I'm not going to jeopardize. I'm not okay with jeopardizing my mom's health because she has to take care of your dad. So these are things that happen every single day because those are the calls I get. Those are, those are that 92% that I told you about on the first slide crisis calls because people don't have these types of conversations. So conversations to have with your family about documents. Do you have your estate documents in order, like your living will, your power of attorney for health care and finances, and your do not resuscitate? What insurance coverage do you have? What do you have for medical insurance, life insurance, disability, car, home, or business? I created, we're going to talk just quick about the grab and go binder so that people can see what that looks like. So it's care right, grab and go binder. There are 11, this is my binder and it's full and I'm just one person. So this is what everybody needs to have in order. There are 11 tabs in this binder. It's a plug and play. So behind each tab, like insurance, finances, assets, business, if you're a business owner, um, your end of life wishes, every insurance, everything that you have that your family is going to need to know to be able to help in, in the event that you lose capacity, it's, it's their toolbox, so to speak, so that they can be successful. So if you name your daughter to be your healthcare power of attorney, but you don't have your health care, but you don't ever talk to her about what are your wishes or your end of life wishes, and you don't even give her a copy of the healthcare power of attorney, how are you expecting your family to be successful? Or say you named, because this is often the case, say you named your son to be the financial power of attorney, but you never told them that you named them. So guess when these kids are finding out that they're the power of attorney? They're at, at the crisis point at the hospital. And so, so if you name someone to be your, your financial power of attorney, they darn, be, they darn well better have what accounts you have, what passwords, what bills come out of which account, which accounts are on auto pay, um, where's the bank box key, you have to get prepared. And I know that people are like, oh, this is, this is overwhelming and it's depressing. If you think it's overwhelming and depressing right now, when, when we're on a, just a simple webinar, wait until you're actually in the throes of this, then that's when you'll find out what overwhelm and depression look like, because it is overwhelming if you're not prepared. You need to find out, were you a veteran? I was so shocked at this, 18 years of families. And I, when I was still an employee and I was like, well, is your dad a veteran? I don't know. We never talk about stuff like this. So even, so even things like, are you a veteran? Families, I don't know what they're talking about, but they're not talking about these types of things. So, because if you're a veteran or your dad's a veteran or mom is a veteran, there may be benefits that they could qualify for that would help offset the cost of care. What bills come from which bank accounts? What are your accounts, passwords, login information? Um, do you have your funeral arrangements in order? Where are your documents? Do you have it in an organized grab and go binder? Or some people will say, if something happens to me, look at that green folder in my closet. Well, that doesn't help you. You have to have actual dialogue about where your documents are and what your wishes are. So the grab and go binder, what I just showed you, um, it's plug and play, there's 11 sections. And the cool thing is that behind each of the 11 tabs, there's a checklist of suggested items to include in that particular section. But the other cool thing is that each of the 11 tabs works as a family agenda item to at least let them know what you have in place so that they don't have to go through this blind and become more overwhelmed than what they would have to be. So relationship considerations as a family, 
and I just say this because you would, you would really hope that the aging process brings families together, that they could work as a team. But I'm, unfortunately, it just seems like, it just, it just seems like families just don't get along and the aging process can be bumpy. And if we don't start talking about the what ifs of aging now, and you wait until you're forced into it, then family dynamics get really dicey really quickly. So what conversations have you had as siblings about the what ifs? Who's going to take, who's going to do which roles that need to be taken care of? So who's going to take care of the core cre- care coordination, who's going to make sure that medications are set up, who's going to make sure that, you know, she's not losing weight or that she's eating. And and so who's going to do what? How is your family holding up? How does your family communicate? Do you, do you even communicate? Some families only talk once a year. That's not going to, that's not going to work. When you have aging loved ones, you have to be in regular communication. What communication system are you using, are you using like a group text, family Facebook group? Uh, some families use Google Docs or they have like a Google calendar so that, especially if there's fa- a large family, they can say, hey, mom has these appointments coming up. Who's gonna provide transportation? Who's, who's gonna make sure she gets there? So it's a good tool to use to help you communicate with each other so that nothing gets missed and so that you start working as a team if you're not already. So how often are you communicating and how often are you holding a family meeting? I encourage, especially with families with dementia or progressive diseases, that you cannot have enough family meetings because their conditions will change quickly. One fall, one wander away from the house, one silver alert because he got lost while he's driving will force you to work as a family um, and have a family meeting anyway. So the more that you can educate yourselves about dementia and aging, Um, the better outcomes you all will have. I promise you that. Are you working as a team? Are you all pitching in and helping or is one sibling taking care of everything? That's usually the case. And that's that's the person that calls me for help is because they're burned out. How are you preventing caregiver burnout with your siblings? And I can just say just from almost 30 years of working with families, um, when siblings mean well, but they flippantly say, well, just call me if you need anything, that doesn't usually fly. Just, <laughs> just some, some tip on that, that, that you, you want to offer specific help. You know, where are you struggling? Um, do you need help with care coordination? I mean, I have a whole checklist of roles that need to be taken care of, duties that need to be taken care of that I go through with families and say, okay, here's what mom's needs are. Here's what dad's needs are. And often they have different needs. So who's going to do what? And what do we need to outsource and pay a professional to handle? So what is an aging plan? Let me check on time. We're doing great. There's going to be questions at the end. Sometimes I go right up to the end and I'm like, oh, because there's just so much information and like day-to-day things I want to make sure you all kind of get. Annalee, if we need to go over a little bit, that's okay. Okay. (laughs) I don't want you to feel rushed. No, no, no. I'll be, I'll, I'm good. I just, I just don't want to, I want to make sure that there's enough time for questions because, um, There usually are a lot of questions and we're always like scrambling at the end. So why an aging plan matters. Um, There is a study done in insurance company. Insurance companies are starting to kind of wisen up and be like, ooh, all these people that we thought (laughs) who had long-term care insurance policies, we we thought that they wouldn't actually need them and here they are needing them. And so there's, there's, there's starting, thankfully, to be a lot more awareness about family caregivers and adult children and just kind of our aging crisis that we're in. So there's starting to be a lot more studies and research done, which is fantastic. So Um, 58% of adult children found themselves thrust into the role of caregiving without having any type of family meeting. So this is what we talk about at the beginning of the slides where I said 92% of my families come to me in a crisis. It's because they're in a crisis and now they're, they're family caregivers and they're burned out. They've quit their jobs or they've jeopardized their careers and their siblings don't get along. And so we see that 58% of adult children um, find themselves thrust into that role of caregiving and they're not prepared in any, in any way, emotionally, physically, financially, and just even having proper documents in order. 
Aging 2.0 did a study that 47% of seniors do not follow through with hospital or skilled rehab discharge instructions. So no one to help be, and why it's not that difficult to understand why it's it's simple because when you get out of the hospital or you get out of the rehab center you're you're still not feeling up to par. You know, it's not like insurance makes makes you be able to stay there until you're in tip top shape. <laughs> they in Medicare when they do pay for these types of services as soon as you are just even nearly okay enough, they they cut you off from Medicare payment. So um, so you're still not feeling well. They might not have anyone there to help them coordinate the slew of doctor's appointments that always happens after you've been in the hospital or in a rehab center. Um, like when my mom fell and she went to the hospital and had, she ended up with like, I'm not kidding, 16 doctor's appointments that were all time sensitive because she had to go to the ortho because she fell and she had broken her shoulder. So she had like six ortho appointments, all just kind of, she had a catheter. So she had like four urology appointments and those are all time sensitive and, and then all the therapy. So, so that's just one person. And if you have two aging parents, <laughs> it quickly becomes a, a full-time job. So you can see why 47% of seniors, if they don't have someone there to help coordinate their care, make sure that they get to their appointments and, and check their medications and, and provide transportation because they're probably not driving yet. You can see why they fail at home. So all right, why an aging plan matters. Genworth did, the, did a study in 2018. They found that 46% of family caregivers had to work fewer hours, 30% missed career opportunities, 63% are paying for their loved one's care out of their own funds, 42% reduce their contributions to their own savings and retirement. That's this slide is where I talk about with financial planners because this is the numbers that should matter to them. <laughs> because if you're not working and contributing to your retirement account, um, you're not going to have a very good retirement and um, that's not good either. So 42% so reduce their contributions to their own savings retirement. 35% of family caregivers lost vacation time or sick time. 35% of family caregivers have repeated work absences. 30% missed career opportunities. Because guess what? If you, if you can't, um, you're not going to take that job promotion and you're not going to get promoted if you're gone all the time taking care of mom and dad. If you're a realtor and you're a realtor in North Carolina, but your two aging parents, you know, live in two different states because they're divorced, you're not going to be able to keep your job or you're not going to be able to stay in business very long if you're not there to work on it or meet your sales or your production goals if you're an employee. So 23% are repeatedly late for work. 63% are paying for care out of their own pocket for their aging loved ones. 48% of families reduce their base quality of living because they're financially supporting their aging parents. And 42% are reducing their contributions to their own savings. So these are things that your financial planners, um, you need to be asking them about, you know, how are you going to help me? If I'm a family caregiver, how are you going to help me plan for this? Especially if you do want to be a caregiver to your parents, you can be and it can work as long as there's a plan in place, just like life, right? We spend our whole life planning, so why would we not plan for aging? 66% of females um, are the caregivers, so usually it's the adult daughter or daughter-in-law, um, and that's great if your daughter-in-law is taking care of you. That must mean, or hopefully that means she likes you, but in in a lot of families I work with, it's the daughter-in-law who calls me because she's burned out and she didn't really like her in-laws in the first place. And now the now her husband is like, well, you can take care of my parents. And she's like, wait, what? <laughs> so, um, so again, these are why we have to have a family meeting and put an aging plan in place. 58% of caregivers are between ages 25 to 54. The average age is down from 53 in 2010 to 47 in 2018. So people are getting, caregivers are getting younger as, as people age. 47% of adults aged 40 to 59 are simultaneously raising children and caring for aging parents. 
That's that sandwich generation that we talk about. And in total, family caregivers provide more than 37 billion hours of care annually. So again, if you're providing care and, and family caregiving is unpaid normally. So if you're providing care and you're not getting paid, um, that's where it affects your finances. Family members provide more than 95% of non-professional care for older adults, not in nursing homes. So that's pretty significant, right? 95% of non-professional care for older adults that are not in nursing homes. So we have a family caregiver um, epidemic out there that we need to start addressing as a society. Aging planning, home care and supports uh, that are available. There's home care that can help you age in place at home. And that's like a whole nother topic that we can talk about the benefits and pros and cons of aging in place at home. Respite care is an option if there's, um, you know, home care companies can help with that or some facilities. Uh, you can have your loved one temporarily kind of move in for a couple, three weeks to give you a break or if there's a vacation that you need to take but you can't bring your loved one with you, then there's respite care. There's adult day programs where you, you take your loved one to a, an adult day center for the day. Senior centers, there's CCRCs, which are a continuum of care retirement communities. And there's a whole slew of value with that, especially if you have two aging parents and they need two different levels of care. Um, standalone facilities, kind of the risks of what happens with a standalone facility, especially if you have um, two parents and you've got, you know, most people don't want their parents separated. But if you move into a standalone facility where it's just assisted living, that's not going to work than if your other parent needs memory care, if it's not a memory care facility. So there's just a lot of things that families don't think about, and that's why I do what I do, is to help families navigate all of this stuff. What happens if one parent needs a different level of care than the other? What if one parent dies before the other? Where's that other surviving spouse going to go? Are they safe at home, or do they need to relocate? So there's a lot of things that, um, considerations we need to think about when there's a widow. What if the primary caregiver dies? We talked about how the caregiver has a 65% higher mortality rate because, the, because of the demands of caregiving. So who will take care of the other and where will the remaining spouse live? Just to go back on that last bullet, since I see that the next slide is the last one. So when I ask my clients, my clients, the whole family, right? It's, it's all of you. So when I ask the, the primary caregiver, we, maybe it's the spouse, maybe it's mom and dad and they're in their 80s. When I ask the primary caregiver what keeps them up at night, it's who's going to take care of my husband if I die or vice versa, if it's the husband taking care of the wife. So that is the number one thing that people worry about, your moms and dads are worried about is who's going to take care of who if, if I pass away and where's you know, is there enough money to take care of us properly and, and not be a burden on our kids? So that's just a lot of information. <laughs> I always throw out a lot of information for families to think about, but it's because it's, it's such a, aging and dementia are so complex. And I see families fumbling, literally fumbling because they don't know what they're doing and they're trying to do their best and they're, you know, they're in uncharted territory but there's, that's why you need to have a professional to help you navigate, just like you have your financial planner, you know, help you navigate the financial plan and you hire, you know, a, a fitness coach to help you get in fit, you know, get in fit the best way possible. People bring me in to their team on their family to help you navigate aging considerations so that your parents and all of you as adult children really have good outcomes without getting burned out or, um, you know, making terrible, terrible financial decisions because you don't know what you're doing. So that's, those are the components of the aging plan. That's, you know, information about Alzheimer's and dementia that hopefully you found helpful. All right. Are there any questions? All right. Yeah, we have a couple, Annalie. Okay. Um, Eric uh, asks, uh, can you talk about the heredity components of Alzheimer's? Sure. So um, I don't have those 
statistics available on, on the slides because we just kind of did an overview. Um, but there there is there is evidence that if your you know if it's if your parents have dementia or Alzheimer's that you could be at risk. Many cases of dementia or Alzheimer's are what we call sporadic, though. It's just it just happens. It's it's not because your parents have it. It's just what we call sporadic. But there can be a genetic, um, there can be a genetic um, component to Alzheimer's. Like my mom actually just passed away and she has dementia and, and almost everyone in her family um, has dementia. So in my, in my experience, you know, there, there it can be a genetic um, variation there, but um, a lot of cases are just, I don't want to say fluke, but that's kind of what sporadic means. And I have another one. Is, is it possible to have some of the symptoms earlier than the later stage? Uh, one of the, our attendees, her mom is diagnosed with early onset, but she's already seeing symptoms that were described in the third stage. Yep. Yeah. So early onset um, usually means people that are in their 40s, 50s, or 60s. And there's a whole slew of, of um, dementia um, diagnoses. Like there's Huntington's disease that usually strikes women in their 40s. There's what we used to call PICS disease, which now they call frontal temporal lobe disease because that's so much easier to say than PICS. <laughs> um, and that strikes men in their 50s. And so usually when there's an early onset dementia, they progress through the disease process much faster and they usually pass away faster than than someone who ends up with more of a slow progressing dementia in their 70s or 80s. At least that's been my experience. All right. And then uh, another attendee, what options are available through Medicaid and how do you qualify? Oh, okay. So that's a loaded question because Medicaid varies from state to state and county to county. So to help you answer that question, I'm going to direct you to to the Aging and Disability Resource Center. <laughs> so that's the ADRC and every county across the country and well, unless the pandemic killed it, but pre-pandemic, every county has an ADRC which can answer some general questions or at least refer you to Medicaid attorneys, but you'll need to, you'll want to talk to a Medicaid attorney. So like here in Florida, we have a generous Medicaid program, like you can have a lot of assets and still qualify because you can do asset protection just like you can in most other states. But like in Florida, because people are like, oh, well, it doesn't matter if we run out of money or it doesn't matter if mom and dad run out of money, we'll just put them on Medicaid. But there's a whole, when you go on state assistance, you lose options. You only can go where there's an open bed. <laughs> you can only see the providers that, contract with Medicaid and here in Florida, like Medicaid only will pay for 16 hours a week of home care. And that's not sufficient if you have a loved one who's frail, medically complex or has dementia. So Medicaid, that's, that is a whole beast of its own for a question. So you will want to find a Medicaid attorney in your area and learn about Medicaid in your area. All right, I'm gonna throw in one of my questions that I have. Uh, it appeared that two thirds of the people with Alzheimer's are female. Is that a longevity thing or is there any reason as to why women are experiencing it in greater? Yeah, we do. We, that statistic hasn't really changed a lot because forever, like, cause I've been in healthcare for so long. <laughs> um, we just, women live longer for a lot of different reasons, I suppose. But so because we live longer, we're at a higher risk of getting Alzheimer's and dementia. So um that, that statistic has, hasn't really changed a whole lot <laughs> other than now that we're all getting older and, and there's more women, you're going to see more, more dementia with us. So I think I saw a question about Lewy body as well. Um, I just wanted to bring that one up because that's also, that's a unique demented, that's a unique um, dementing illness as well that has a whole set of its own symptoms um, and, tr and treatment, because that, that is its own, that is this Lewy body disease is its own, own dementing illness. So usually uh, red flag symptoms with that one or signs with that one is hallucinations. So that's one of the hallmark um, characteristics of someone with Lewy body disease is visual or audio hallucinations, which may or may not be scary to the person having them. Uh, 
Someone asks, in the middle stage of Alzheimer's, why are social events difficult for them? Because they can't handle the stimulation. So again, and I don't know, there's probably people that aren't like watching this because you're driving or listening to it, but your brain shrinks. So think about a normal sized brain. It just keeps shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. That's what dementia is. It's a memory disease. It's a, it's a brain disease. So when your brain is your control center for your speech, for your ability to know if you're hungry, if you're in pain, if you just ate, our brain tells us how to think and how to respond and how to process information. It does that today, whether you have dementia or not. And so as your disease progresses or as your loved one's disease progresses and their brain is continually shrinking, um, that's why you're going to see changes in their mood, their behavior, personality, their ability to eat, their ability to, to take care of themselves. Um, you're going to see them doing more wandering, more sundowning, where they get more um, uh, restless and anxious and agitated in the late afternoon. It can maybe be for an hour. Some family caregivers have their loved ones are sundowning from like three o'clock until 10 o'clock at night where they're just very hard to redirect. Problems I see is often families because they haven't taken the time to understand and research what their loved one has. They spend a lot of time and frustration arguing with their loved one, trying to bring their loved one into our reality. And painful things that I see them do because they, they just don't know because they haven't done any research or done enough research is, you know, if your mom, you know, um, say your dad passed away and your mom is like, well, where's, where's dad? Where's, where's Henry? Where is he? And then the adult kids say, well, he died, you know, 15 years ago. How come you don't remember that? You know? And so there's, that's how I can tell when, when they haven't spent the time that they need to understanding dementia and really knowing how to communicate properly and effectively. So actually created dementia coaching packages because I see this every single day with families just really not understanding the disease and you wouldn't because you're in uncharted territory. So I have dementia coaching packages specific to what your family is going through so that you can have better visits, better outcomes and um, your loved one can have a more meaningful quality of life as well. And then we have one last question. Would it make sense for me to pay for a long-term care policy for my parent if my parent can afford it, but I can? Well, that is a question for like a financial planner or um, it, cause it just, it just depends on what your situation is. Every, every situation is so unique um, but we know, I mean, we know that dementia is prevalent. We know that being a family caregiver is more likely than not to happen. And we know that insurance isn't going to pay for care. So if you have the means to afford some sort of financial solution, and that makes sense, and you're in a financial position to do so, um, Maybe that maybe that's the right solution, but I'm not a financial planner and I'm not an attorney, so I just want to make sure that that's clear. <laughs> but if you have the financial means, and, and that's some of what my clients do, it's it's a son or a daughter who have been very successful, who have the means to pay for my services and and are paying for some of their care, which leads us back to those statistics where the adult kids are paying for their parents' care. And then one last question for me. Uh, last week, Biogen uh, won approval from the FDA for that for their the first ever Alzheimer's drug. Are you hopeful um, that that should help treat the condition? I'm always hopeful when there's something <laughs> new that comes out that might be able to relieve um, the gut wrenching pain that dementia. Um, leaves on, on not only the patient, but the family. So I'm hopeful, you know, the Alzheimer's Association, which is where we got a lot of this content and a lot of the, the statistics anyway, um, about Alzheimer's specifically was from the Alzheimer's Association website, which is fantastic for resources. I mean, they get federal funding. I mean, with, with the amount of money that, that is donated to them and grants and funding, they should be able to come up with something that's going to work for these patients. At this. And I think that does it for the questions. Does, does anyone else have a question? 
Well, what happens sometimes is that we're not able to get to all the questions. So go ahead and leave your question. If you need to leave your phone number and we can reach out to you um, during this during this outro time, uh, we will have someone reach out and contact you. So first of all, uh, I wanna thank our presenter today. Thank you, Annalise, so much. We wanna thank, thank Terrence for moderating and the organizations that brought you this presentation today. Thank you so much to our attendees for attending. It says a lot when we have people who want to learn about these things, be prepared and be part of the solution. Uh, we're, we're really glad that you're doing that. Look for an email soon with a link to a replay of this event, and you're welcome to share that replay with your friends or family. We will be also hosting this on our YouTube channel for uh, reference. Here at Advice Chaser, we're all about helping you find a financial advisor who is a great fit for you, your life and your situation and your financial questions. Our matching service is free to you and every one of our advisor partners has committed to offer a free initial consultation to anyone we introduce them to. Find out more by going to advicechaser.com and clicking on the link to find an advisor. Once again, from Advice Chaser, thank you so much for coming. We will see you at another webinar soon. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.